Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on AMC Movie News, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campy. I'm the editor-in-chief of AMC Movie News. And AMC Mailbag is a much more laid-back, relaxed show. All, all we do is just take the questions that you guys send in. It's much more laid-back, relaxed, talk about some behind-the-scenes stuff, whatever. Very casual. It's really a lot like a radio show than a video podcast in a lot of ways, but... That's the way we like to do it around here. Uh, and hey, listen, I want to let you know, if you have a question or a comment that you want to get on AMC Mailbag or on AMC Movie Talk, you can email us anytime at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Send on in your questions and uh, maybe, you know, your question will be on AMC Mailbag or AMC Mail Talk, uh, Mail Talk, AMC Movie Talk uh, one of these days. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to waste a lot of time here. We're going to get into it, uh, but I do want to mention one more time a special thank you to all of you guys who last weekend, on last weekend's mailbags, who actually called in and sent in your phone calls. Last weekend, we did beta test a new feature that we're going to start using a little bit on AMC Mailbag, which is the call-in feature, where you guys can actually call in and leave your message uh, at the uh, AMC Mailbag hotline. And we are going to incorporate those into Mailbag moving forward once we start doing AMC Mailbag on a daily basis. And in case you hadn't heard, we're going to be starting uh, before the end of the year. We're going to start AMC Mailbag uh, on a daily basis. It's just a p one part of AMC Movie News Phase 3. Um, so AM AMC Movie News Phase 1 was, of course, just getting Movie Talk started. Phase 2 was introducing Mailbag and moving into the brand new studio where we do, you know, at the stream.tv where we do the shows there. And we are getting ready to move into Phase 3. And I've already told you guys, that uh, AMC Movie News Phase 3, uh, one of the things that's going to be involved with that is that Mailbag is actually going to become a daily show. Uh, one of the other things that is coming for AMC Movie Bag Phase, uh, <laughs> AMC Movie News Phase 3, <laughs> it's Sunday morning, give me a break. Um, phase 3 is, uh, we are, you know, we did AMC Jedi Council as a four-part, you know, test series. Did it for four weeks, and uh, due to popular demand, we are making it a regular weekly show. So AMC Jedi Council is going to be coming back before the end of the year. And then, you know, also part of Phase 3, we kind of got a little bit of a jump start, is the new AMC Indie Spotlight. Um, the show we do here on AMC Movie News, where all we do is talk about independent film. That's already been launched. I hope you guys are subscribed to it and following it on YouTube.com slash AMC Independent. That's where we've get. It's such a unique show that we gave it its own channel. And we're very excited about it. Um, so, yeah, there's a, a few elements of Phase 3. We've got a few more elements of Phase 3 coming, uh, most of which will be implemented by the end of the year. So, once again, special thank you to everybody who helped us beta test the phone-in feature last weekend. Really appreciate uh, you guys helping us out. All right, so with all that being said, let's get on to question number one for this Sunday. And the first question today comes to us from Anwar, who writes... Thank you for your show. It is very enjoyable and informative. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate that. We try anyway. My question is about the movie Passengers, based on uh, John Spith's script, which should star Keanu Reeves as the main protagonist. I heard many good things about the script and wonder if you know what stage of pre-production slash production uh, this movie is in now. Do they even plan to do this movie at the moment? Okay. Uh, great question. For those of you who don't know what uh, Anwar is talking about, there's this movie um, called Passengers coming out. It was uh, announced last year, actually. It was picked, it was bought by the Weinstein Company last year at Cannes in 2013. And Keanu Reeves has been attached to be the star almost since the beginning. Now, when the Weinstein Company bought the film and bought the, the rights, the distribution rights to the film, at the time with Keanu Reeves was Reith, uh, Academy Award winner Reese Witherspoon was also attached to star. Now, since then, Reese Witherspoon has left the project and then Rachel McAdams came on to replace her. So you lost Reese Witherspoon, but you got Rachel McAdams. Okay, that's fine. But since then, Rachel McAdams has also uh, departed the film. Um, so it was just left with um, Keanu Reeves. Now, in the midst of all that, the Weinstein Company dropped the movie. So they said, we don't want the distribution rights to anymore, and they dropped it. Um, and since the Weinstein Company dropped it, I believe Focus Features 
Um, he then came along and picked it up, and Focus Features now has the distribution rights to the film. It's set to be directed by a guy named Brian Kirk. Um, and Brian Kirk has never directed a feature film, but he's directed an episode of Game of Thrones. He's directed an episode of uh, Boardwalk Empire. He's directed an episode of Dexter. Um, so this would be his first feature film. And to the best of my knowledge, the movie is about um, this big group of people who are on an interstellar journey to go to this new planet to inhabit, I guess. And 90 years too soon, one guy wakes up. And that's Keanu Reeves' character. And I don't know why, maybe it's loneliness or whatever after a while, but he eventually wakes up another one of the passengers, which was going to be Reese Witherspoon, and then it was going to be Rachel McAdams. Now we don't know who it's going to be. Um, and I don't know much more about the film beyond that. I have actually heard the same things you have. The script, from what I'm hearing, is supposed to be pretty good. But we've seen good scripts turn into bad movies, whatever. Um, so I don't know why this film has suddenly, you know, run into a brick wall. I don't know why they lost Reese Witherspoon. I don't know why they lost Rachel McAdams. I don't know why Weinstein's dropped it. Probably had something to do with losing Reese Witherspoon, which is one of the reasons they picked up the film in the first place. Uh, I don't know why Focus pitch picked it up. But anyway, the last I heard was this March. So April, May, June, July, August, September. Okay, so that was six months ago. The last development I heard of regarding Passengers was that Focus Features picked it up. But that was six months ago. To the best of my knowledge, no cast has been announced. No progress has been announced. The film is not in production at this point. Um, although if you go to IMDb Pro, if you have a Pro account, uh, they do list it as pre-production still. But, I mean, they could be listed as pre-production and it's still just sitting on a shelf. I don't know if this film's going to happen. I mean, I got to assume that Focus Features didn't just pick up the rights to it for giggles. But just because Focus Features picked up the distribution rights, that doesn't mean that the producers of the film are actually going to make the film. So, um, yeah, that's the best I've got. So, just to summarize, Weinstein, no longer involved. Witherspoon, no longer involved. McAdams no longer involved. Focus Features is involved. Keanu Reeves still attached, but as best my knowledge, no other cast and no other details <clears throat> have been revealed at that point. So that's just about everything I know about Passengers. Um, so let's keep our eyes on it and, and see uh, how the rest of this transpires. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today uh, comes to us from Robert Foxworth, who writes... Why haven't we seen any actors from the Incredible Hulk movie in other parts of the Marvel Cinematic Universe? I know about Edward Norton, but what about William Hurt or Liv Tyler? Thanks for the best damn movie news on the planet. Well, thank you so much for the kind words, Robert, and thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so for those who may not know, um, when he says, I know about Robert uh, or um, Edward Norton, you know, there was a lot of drama surrounding Edward Norton and Marvel and the producers when the movie was coming out that, you know, Edward didn't like that. He didn't have edit edit control. He didn't get uh, script credit because apparently he worked a lot on the script himself. But he I guess maybe not enough that the Screenwriters Guild said you can't put your name on the screenwriting credit. And then he like refused to do a bunch of the publicity for the film and big falling out. It was all a big mess. So. That's why we're not seeing Edward Norton as the Hulk anymore. That's why when the Avengers came along, uh, it's Mark Ruffalo now is our Dr. Banner and not Edward Norton. And it's too bad that that happened because I actually thought Edward Norton was, a, was pretty good. Um, and he's a great actor altogether. So, but it brings up, but the question Robert's asking is, okay, well, that's fine, Edward Norton. But, but you know, where's, where's Hurt? Where's, where's Liv Tyler? Like, why, why haven't they popped up in the Marvel Cinematic Universe since that time? And honestly... Well, I have not to talk. To, I haven't talked to Kevin Feige about it. the The question, as a fan, I would raise in I would raise is why would they have been in it? I mean, there's no place for them in the stories they've had so far. Like, just because you have a character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe doesn't mean you have to start throwing them in everything that there is, or start throwing them in stories where they just quite frankly don't belong. I mean, so who do you take out of Avengers if you've got William Hurt as Thunderbolt Ross? Who do you take out? Who do you take out of Avengers if you have Liv Tyler there? And really, what would have been the purpose of Liv Tyler? What like characters need to serve the story? Uh, actors need to serve the characters, and by extension, serve the story. And 
in all the Marvel Cinematic Universe so far, there's been no, other than the Hulk movie, there's been no need to have Thunderbolt Ross there. There's been no need to have Liv Tyler there. So, um, there's, I mean, so Robert, you ask, and you fairly ask, why haven't they been there? But my response would kind of be, why would they be there? There, there was no point. Now, that being said, I still believe that in the back of Kevin or of uh, Kevin Feige's head, I do believe he's still looking at a couple of other Hulk characters. Tim Roth, who played Abomination. I thought Tim Roth was great in that Hulk movie. I really do. And I think there's a reason they didn't kill Abomination at the end of The Incredible Hulk. Remember, Abomination's still alive. Abomination is one of the few legitimate threats in the galaxy to the Hulk. Because he, he basically is the Hulk. I mean, right? So he is the, he's the only one of the very, 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 very few guys in the galaxy and universe who can stand toe-to-toe and fight the Hulk. Um, so I believe he's a really cool character. I really like the character design of Abomination in the movie, and I liked uh, Tim Roth a lot in it. And so he's a very valuable tool to have in your chest. And I think Kevin Feige knows that. And I think there may be plans. If not plans, I think Abomination is at least a contingency plan that, hey, if we ever start doing other Hulk stuff, then Abomination becomes a legitimate option for us to use. But it's more than just Tim Roth and Abomination. Um, uh, Tim Tim Blake Nelson, great actor, by the way, super underrated. Um, by the end of the Hulk film, we saw that he was starting to turn into the leader. And the last thing we see of him is, you know, his head starting to do the blah, 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 blah. And he just smiles as if he's starting to become aware of everything, you know. That was really well done. So you got a great actor there. Um, you've got an interesting character. Uh, so th- there's a possibility for the leader. I think it's more probable for Abomination. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they are going to use Abomination at any point. I'm not saying that they are. I'm just saying I think it makes sense. I think out of any of the characters we saw in The Incredible Hulk, other than the Hulk, that would make sense to continue on into the bigger Marvel Cinematic Universe, I think it's Tim Roth and the Abomination. I think there's a possibility there for that. So, once again, let's keep our eyes open and see what happens there. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from, where am I going? Uh, Devin Singletary, who writes, Hey, AMC, love the show. Thank you so much. Uh, John recently said on the show that if Batman vs. Superman is good, then they will automatically catch up to Marvel in one movie, which is bogus, because Marvel has so many good movies already. Then John said, if Batman vs. Superman sucks, then DC is done. My question is, how bad would the backlash be if this movie totally bombs? Um, Okay, well, let me clear a couple things up here. I never said that... um, if Batman vs. Superman is just good, it will have caught up to Marvel. I said if it's great. If Batman vs. Superman is a great movie and knocks it out of the park, I said in one move, it is DC and Warner Brothers have caught up to Marvel. In one move. Now, if we're going to say that, and if I'm going to say that, well, what's the measurement? What's the metric? What makes us be able to say it did or did not catch up? Um, Like, what is it we're measuring to say it has caught up or it hasn't caught up? So let me tell you why I believe if Batman vs. Superman is great, it will have caught up with Marvel. Because I'm measuring it by this. After um, Green Lantern and all these delays, and while I thought Man of Steel was an awesome movie, Best com- out of the four major comic book movies of 2013, Man of Steel to me, easily the best. Um, I thought it was not a good movie. I thought it was a great movie. But there are there are a number of people out there who were underwhelmed by it. And so, fair enough. So after Green Lantern and after some people were underwhelmed by Man of Steel, when you say, hey, a new Marvel movie is coming out tomorrow and hey, a new DC movie is coming out tomorrow, as of right now... There is more public trust amongst the movie fans and more there would be more anticipation amongst movie fans for the Marvel movie coming out tomorrow because Marvel has been doing it so good. Even though they've had a couple of hiccups, Iron Man 2, anybody? Even though Marvel has had a couple of hiccups, I contend that as of right now, amongst the general movie-going audience, if you say tomorrow there's a DC movie opening 
if just generically, a DC movie opening tomorrow and a Marvel movie opening tomorrow, there will be more anticipation, more excitement, more awareness, more everything for the Marvel movie because up to this point, Marvel has done it better. Up to this point. Um, and I think even, even the most diehard of DC fanboys will admit that up until this point, Marvel has done it better. So Marvel is quite far ahead. But you see, now DC is putting their biggest bullets in their biggest gun. Batman and Superman. In a movie you're titling Batman vs. Superman. The movie that gushing sweaty nerds like me have been waiting for for 20 years for this movie. So now you're doing, you get your two biggest bullets in your biggest gun and you're making them fight each other and you're calling it Batman versus Superman. You put that movie out and you crush it. Like you just knock that movie out of the park. Then the whole landscape changes. The whole landscape changes. So we can sit here and say, oh, but Marvel's still done so many more better movies. That's true. They have. But I'm telling you right now that if Batman versus Superman, let's fast forward 18 months, Batman versus Superman crushes it and kills it and is amazing. It's a huge box office hit and fans loved it and all that kind of stuff. Then that scenario I was telling you about, put out a DC movie tomorrow and a Marvel movie tomorrow, which one are the average moviegoers more excited about, aware of, and anticipating more? They're anticipating the Marvel movie more. Well, yeah, fast forward now 18 months. Batman kills it. I'm sorry, they've caught up. I've caught up. They've caught up. You put out an amazing Batman vs. Superman movie, and then you ask the, the average moving going public, hey, what are you looking forward to tomorrow more? A new DC movie that after just coming off this amazing Batman vs. Superman or a new Marvel movie, which has this great track record of films already, it's going to be a dead heat. It's going to be a dead heat. Now, that's all contingent <laughs> on Batman vs. Superman not just being good, but being awesome. If it's good, I think they will have done a lot of work to help catch up, but they won't completely catch up. They just won't. Not, not, not with one good film, but it'll be a great start. It'll be a great start. I've said a thousand times, you just make that movie good, and I'm, I'm happy. You just make Batman vs. Superman good, and I'm happy. But they make it awesome? I'm telling you they've caught up. Now... Uh, the second part of the thing is that I said if they blow it, then DC's dead. Uh, you know what? I probably did use those words, uh, but but I'm speaking in hyperbole. Um, I think if Batman versus Superman sucks and they really blow it, uh, then then they're really in trouble. Then they are in a, a just a world of hurt. They're in a world of trouble because <clears throat> it's you're rolling all your dice now, right? By putting your two biggest bullets in your biggest gun, you're, that means you're putting all your eggs in one basket. The payoff is unbelievable. Like I said, you knock this out of the park, you've caught up with Marvel. But if you blow it, the consequences are even worse. I mean, you can blow Green Lantern. And, you know, I, I don't think Green Lantern was as bad as most people say it is. It was, it was a disappointment. No doubt about it. It was a disappointment. I didn't think it was as bad as most people said. But, <clears throat> but now you take Batman and Superman, put them in a movie called Batman vs. Superman, and you blow it? Now the consequences are even worse. So it's going to be tough. So you end off your question saying, hey, how bad is the backlash going to be if this movie bombs? The backlash will be huge. The backlash will be huge from fans. The backlash will be huge from critics. And the backlash will be huge from the studio. The studio are going to put some heads on the chopping block and hold somebody accountable if Batman vs. Superman blows it. So there's a lot on the line for, for Warner Brothers right now. Warner Brothers and, uh, and DC. They need this to be great. Because if they make it great... The rewards are incredible, but if they blow it, there's going to be consequences. So uh, let's keep our fingers crossed as fans that they knock this one out of the park. All right, <clears throat> let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Chris Scott, who writes, I'm a big fan of movie posters. Uh, my favorites are the ones they give out after movies for IMAX premieres, and they do do some really good IMAX premiere posters. Anyway, I've managed to get quite a few, and they are all so nice. My question for you guys, is there any one official or definitive poster for a movie? I know, especially nowadays, there are tons of posters for each movie, so how do you know which one is the official poster? Thanks, guys, and keep doing what you do. Yeah, it is kind of crazy, Chris. They, I mean, now it's like every week, five new posters come out for a movie, like character posters and special posters and the international poster and all that kind of stuff. But to, to answer your question simply, 
Is there one definitive poster for movie? Technically speaking, yes. And it's what they call the official one sheet. Um, and it's the one, I mean, sometimes the studio won't even put out their one sheet till like a week or two before the movie comes out, but normally earlier than that. But the point is at some point the studio says, yes, this is the poster. So they'll say to movie theaters like AMC theaters and others, they'll say, Hey guys, this is the poster. So please, when you, when you're advertising the movie on amctheaters.com or putting up posters in the theaters, whatever, this is the identifying poster that we would like you guys to use. This is the one sheet. This is the definitive, the official one sheet. Um, now, after the movie does its theatrical release, you know, then it's on home video, then they change the DVD covers, which I think is a stupid practice. I've never understood that. Like going back, I still remember the first couple of times I've noticed that studios started putting different covers on their DVDs um, than were the actual posters of the movie. I always thought that was dumb. I, I still think it's dumb. Other people have different opinions. That's cool. Um, but so yes, Chris, to answer your question, there are definitive, uh, one sheets. Sometimes they come out pretty late in the game, but usually they come out a few months early. Um, and that is the official poster and, uh, a good way to look up, to figure out which one is which just look up, um, you know, uh, cloudy with a chance of meatballs to official one sheet and, and you'll probably find it and come up with it that way. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Daniel Kerr, who writes, with Avengers 2 coming next year and Cap 3 after, does having different directors in Marvel cause problems? I mean, each director has their own vision, like Cap's uniform, for example. Do these visions clash, as in Ant-Man? Or does Feige tell them, by Feige, that he means Kevin Feige, president uh, of, of Marvel Studios, or does Feige tell them beforehand what the vision is? Where does creativity end and marching orders begin? Thanks and keep up the great work. Well, thanks a lot for the question, uh, Daniel. And I mean, yeah, that, that's the tricky thing, right? About um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe and having one big shared cinematic universe where you need to have several directors working on different properties all at once, but they're supposed to be all part of the same universe. So there has to be a continuity. There has to be a flow. There has to be connective tissue that makes all these films work together, right? So... What happens is, you know, we just, uh, this past week, we had the Russo brothers, the directors of Captain America 2 and 3. We had them in studio with us, and we, we had a great conversation with them. But they actually hung out with us for about a half hour afterwards, too. And we were just talking. And one of the things that they were talking about was how Kevin Feige comes to them as the directors, okay, and says, okay, here are the things that need to happen in this film. Because remember, Kevin Feige is the one who's thinking about the whole universe, Kevin Feige is thinking about how does Ant-Man connect with Doctor Strange, connect with Captain America 3, connect with Avengers 3, connect with Guardians of the Galaxy, connect with Hulk, connect with Iron Man. How does He's the one who understands how it all connects together. So when you're going into a Marvel film, each film has to hit certain beats. And, and Kevin Feige is the one who passes it on. Now, so what the Russo brothers told us is that Feige comes to them, and says, okay, here are the six main beats that needs to happen in Captain America 2. And Kevin Feige already had this planned out. And he said, one of the big things in Captain America 2 is the fall of S.H.I.E.L.D. and the fall of HYDRA. Um, we're going to have the Winter Soldier. That the Winter Soldier and Captain and Cap have to have this type of a con confrontation. We need this to happen, this to happen, and this to happen. But then, according to the Russos, and, and jo I've talked to Joss Whedon about this too. Then, the director of the film... It's free to say, okay, so here's all these bones. We've got all these bones. Now it's up to the director and their writers to come up with all the flesh and all the connective tissue and do whatever they need to do. It's like, okay, like for instance, if I'm not mistaken, you know, if Feige came to them and said, okay, we want the fall of S.H.I.E.L.D. and the fall of HYDRA in Captain America 2. Okay, but now it's completely up to the Russos. It's like, what brings that about? How does HYDRA fall? How is HYDRA even still around? How, you know, so all the meat of the movie and the connective tissue Kevin Feige puts into the hands of the directors. They say, hit these beats, because once we hit these beats, it'll flow into what we need to do for the larger universe, but everything else is up to you guys. Um, and he did that with Joss Whedon with Avengers. You know, um, <clears throat> Avengers, you know, we've told the story before, but Whedon was telling us about how his, his first plans for Avengers and his first script, um, as, as Joss Whedon put it, was the first draft of Avengers was very waspy. So, I mean, clearly he had wasp in a lot. 
And so, and he didn't have Black Widow. But Kevin Feige comes along and is like, mm, actually, we got plans for Black Widow. And somebody's got to be thinking big picture. And so he tells Joss Whedon, okay, no, we need Black Widow, remove, um, um, remove uh, Wasp, and then make sure you hit this beat, this action beat, this thing has to happen here, and this has to be a part of the story. Now, once Feige gave him the, that skeleton, said these are the things you have to have, then go. Then Joss Whedon writes the dialogue, and he has, and he creates the the character dynamics, and he creates the he creates the meat and the connective tissue of those bones, so that Avengers flows more and and opens up the doors for what they want to do in further Marvel films. So that's the uh, that's the relationship there between them, and and that all that kind of highlights, I think, um, what happened between Marvel and Edgar Wright. Um, and everybody knows. I mean, if, if you look at my Facebook, you know how big of a fan I am of Edgar Wright. I love Edgar Wright. I think he's awesome. I was so excited about watching an Edgar Wright Ant-Man movie. Like, it's just insane. It's crazy how long I've been looking forward to that. But, you know, Edgar had a particular vision for Ant-Man that, that he's had for like five or six years. And, you know, we talked about this on AMC Movie Talk ad nauseum, so I'll just mention it briefly here. But, but... Five or six years ago, maybe Kevin Feige and Marvel thought, yeah, this sounds like a great Ant-Man movie, but that was five or six years ago. Now they have an overall plan and arc and direction and, and style and temperature and, and you know feel for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now there are certain things Ant-Man has to do to fit into the wider universe. And maybe the film that Edgar Wright had planned five, six, seven years ago doesn't fit in anymore to what the larger plan is, to what the big picture is. And, you know, Edgar Wright <clears throat> totally respect his, his own personal artistic integrity, wanting to stick to his gun, said, well, this is the movie I signed up to make, not that movie. <clears throat> and Marvel, I completely respect them for this, saying, hey, this is the way our, the movie now has to be to fit in with our... We got to think about bigger than just Ant-Man. We have to think about how it fits into the whole cinematic universe. So we can't do it the way we were planning on doing it for the last five years. And, <clears throat> you know, it was just it was just a needed split between two parties. And I don't think it was anybody's fault. And so it's I'm really sad that we're not going to see an Edgar Wright Ant-Man. But I totally understand why Marvel wanted to uh, make the changes they want to make. And I totally understand why Edgar Wright that with that being the reality, decided to walk. I respect everybody in this situation. And I think, you know, I don't think it's anybody's fault. But yeah, the all the creativity, yes, they do get the beats from Kevin Feige. The directors have the creativity to build all the meat and, and the connective tissue between it to get to where Feige says, this is where you need to go. Now you come up with how to get there. Um, so it's it's a mixed bag of, of taking directions from Feige, but also infusing their own, their own unique creativity into it to bring it to that point. So I think it's a pretty cool thing. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Paul Avalon, who writes, I'm a big fan of the show. Well, thank you so much, Paul. I was reading comments online about why people didn't like The Amazing Spider-Man 2 because I liked it. Uh, I actually liked it too, Paul. I, I I think it was a big step backwards from The Amazing Spider-Man 1. Huge step backwards, as a matter of fact. Lots of things about the film I didn't like, but overall, I still enjoyed Spider-Man 2. Anyway, a good portion of the reasons were that Gwen dying made them hate the movie. I think that is a ridiculous reason to hate a movie. My question is, is this common? And also, what is the strangest reason why you or someone else hated a movie? Thanks, and bring on the filthy. Um, well, Paul, here's here, let me first say this. And this is just all my opinion. Well, everything I say in the show is just my opinion. But I don't think... You can ever call somebody's reason for not liking a movie a stupid reason. You can agree with it or disagree with it. You can debate it. You can say, hey, I don't think that's logical, all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, movies are so experiential and they're so subjective that, you know, I, I say this all the time. You can put a certain flavor of ice cream in your mouth. It's not your choice whether you like it or not. Your uniqueness, your body, whatever tells you if you liked it or not. It's not your choice. You, either, you can lie and, and choose to say, I like it. You can try to convince yourself to like it, but, but really it's your choice. <clears throat> but how you react and respond and, and all that kind of stuff. So something can feel good, even though it's horrible for you. 
Um, but anyway, so that being the case, and movies being so experiential and so subjective, I don't know that I'd ever call somebody's reasons, whatever they may be, for not liking movies stupid. Ultimately, a movie hit you in the face, and you either liked it or you didn't like it. Whatever the reasons may be, that movie caused a reaction in you, an experiential reaction in you that you either did or did not like it. Okay, and then we talk about the things we liked and didn't like and argue it and debate it and all that kind of stuff, and that's all fun. Um, but ultimately, I'm never going to call somebody stupid because they didn't like this movie because of this. At least I hope I never do that. That'd, that'd be stupid. Stupid. Anyway, um, I will say one of the things that irritated me <clears throat> a lot that has come up recently, uh, and we're just going to go back to Man of Steel. There were a lot of people who did not like Man of Steel. And once again, I am not, I don't like saying, oh, those people who didn't like this movie only didn't like it because of this. I don't like the practice of putting words in other people's mouths. I don't like the practice of, oh, I'm going to tell you why you think what you think. I, I hate that. But in the case of Man of Steel, the reason many people did not like Man of Steel, because I heard this from their, their own mouths myself, was, and I'm paraphrasing here, because it's not the gosh golly Miss Lane, let me rescue the cat from the tree, you know, truth, justice in the American way, Superman, that they wanted from the 1970s. There were, there were a lot of people who wanted the Christopher Reeve Superman. And that's simply not what Man of Steel is. Or Man of Steel was. And quite frankly, in a post-Christopher Nolan Batman world, it's not what the Superman today was ever going to be. It was fine in that cultural context. The Christopher Reeve Superman was great in that cultural context. But today, in this, in this new world that we live in, 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 a, in a Dark Knight Returns, um, in a post-Dark Knight Returns era, um, Superman was going to be different. You still embody the principles of Superman, but he was going to be different. It was going to be a bit darker. It was going to be a, more of a character study. It was going. To, he wasn't going to be, um, let me rescue the boy falling off Niagara Falls or get the cat of the tree or whatever all the different things that Superman did before. And a lot of people didn't like the fact that he killed Zod. Now, that, that one is a stupid argument. That is a stupid argument. Uh, if, if it's what caused them to not like Man of Steel, that's not stupid. But I, I but, but that's just as far as an argument goes saying Batman shouldn't have, or Superman shouldn't have killed Zod because Superman doesn't kill. That That's a dumb argument because we have established Superman has killed in the comic books. He's killed in the comic books. And the way uh, Zack Snyder set up Man of Steel, the, he had no choice. It was either Zod kills all of humanity or Superman breaks his neck. Those are the only two choices presented to Superman. Those are the only two choices the movie presented to Superman, that the circumstances presented to Superman break his neck, or he said, I'm never going to stop till I wipe out all of these humans that you love and care about so much. He already just destroyed like a third of Metropolis. He's going to kill everybody. He had to kill him. And it was not without precedent. He killed in the comic books. So I don't want to go into that whole argument again. Um, but as far as, if, but, but look, if, if Superman killing Zod is what made somebody not like the film, hey man, that's, just, that's, their, that's their experience. That's what happened. And, and, and I don't think we should tell people, oh, that's a stupid reason to not like a movie. I don't know that there is a stupid movie to, a stupid reason to like or not like a movie. It's just what happens, man. It's just our experience with it. Uh, I think there are smart and dumb arguments but I don't think, even though this is the biggest uh, thing to me, I don't think that if somebody said to me, I did not like Man of Steel because Superman killed Zod, I can say, well, I, I think it was logical. We can discuss it. We can debate it. But at the end of the day, it's, that's their reasoning. That's their experience. How can I argue your experience? Your experience is unique to you. It is yours and yours alone. And so I can't debate it. But we can we can debate the 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 topic. We can debate you know the issues around it. But at the end of the day, I can't debate your experience because only you know your experience. So anyway, uh, that was that's a strange one for me. All right, let's move on to the next topic. And the next topic today, the next question today, I should say, comes from Luke McGowan, who writes, "Hi John, 
Uh, uh, why is my wife coming in the room? Told you, stay out when I'm working, lady. Okay, sorry. Uh, Luke McGowan writes, Hi, John. I really have to lead off with a huge thanks for recommending the Ryan Reynolds film Buried. I watched it yesterday and was absolutely captivated. By the way, guys, if you have not seen Buried, go watch it and then never argue with me again that you don't think Ryan Reynolds is a great actor. Anyway, probably the best film I've seen in a long time. Between Buried and Tom Hardy's Locke, as well as other famous examples, Gravity and Castaway, I've begun to develop the opinion that actors really show what talent they have when they have to carry an entire movie by themselves. Do you agree? Well, absolutely I agree. I mean, that's the thing, because you can have a lot of stuff covered up for you when you're in a full regular movie. You know, we talked yesterday about um, James Gunn making sure that Dave Bautista as Drax the Destroyer in Guardians of the Galaxy was always in situations and scenarios where his strengths were accented and his weaknesses were hidden. But you get into a movie like Castaway, where the vast majority of that film is just Tom Hanks by himself with his environment. You get into a movie like Locke, which is just Tom Hardy in a car. You get into a, a situation like Buried, where it's just Ryan Reynolds in a box for the whole movie. You get into these types of movies, now you can't hide. There's nowhere to hide. And with no other comedy interactions or other action going on on the screen, the only thing that is now going to hold an audience is the actor and their performance. That's it. There's nothing else to lean on. There's nothing to hide behind. It is just the actor and their performance that is either going to keep or lose the audience. And that's why it has to be the most terrifying of thoughts for an actor um, to get into a movie like Buried, like Locke, like Castaway, like Gravity, Sandra Bullock and Gravity. Um, it's just, it's a phenomenal feat to achieve. And when they do it, you got to respect it. You got to respect it. So yeah, I full props to actors. And like you see an actor doing these, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be fascinated from now on, ever since I saw Buried, to watch movies that have just one actor in it. Even if it's just for the majority of the film and not the whole film, but a movie that has just one actor in it, watch that movie if you really want to see what that actor is made of. Because I think that movie is going to tell you a lot about them and show us a lot about them. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from, where is it coming from? My thing is broken. Now, the next question today comes to us from Liam Murray, who writes, what is the saddest movie deaths? For me, it was when Brooks died in Shawshank Redemption. Thanks and bring on the filthy. Um, Man, when Brooks died, killed himself in Shawshank Redemption, it, it wasn't just the death of Brooks. It was how he died. A man who felt so alone, like it's such a lovable, awesome character who was so alone, who realized that now all of his meaning of his life was inside the prison and he no longer felt like he had a place in the world and he he hated the world and just living every day was now a struggle for him. So he ended his life so tragically sad. Um, it was just, just brutal. There are a couple for me uh, that I want to highlight. Um, and the first one is the uh, Kira Kurosawa film, uh, uh, Ikiru, who, which means to live. It's a 1951, 52, 53, 54, somewhere in there, uh, film by Kurosawa. Look, I, that a lot of people will contend, and, and I'll contend maybe his best film that he ever made. And if you don't know anything about it, it's, it's about this character, you know, stuffy, whatever, bureaucratic dude uh, named Watanabe. And he realizes and finds out that he has stomach cancer and he's going to die. And I believe that he's got like a year to live. Anyway, he meets this girl who kind of opens up the world to him that, that living life to do great things and, and to serve people and to make, bring happiness to people, whatever that's, that's meaning in life. He decides that he can change himself and he takes on this project to uh, like get a, a playground built for, for children in this, in this terrible area. Right. And that's his big goal. And He's dying and, and all this kind of stuff. And one of the, the key pivotal moments of the film is him out in the cold, probably hastening his own death, out in the cold, sitting on a swing in the final moments of his life in that park that he had now built for the children. 
and the performance is insane. And I, and I wish I could tell you the name of the actor off the top of my head. I can't. The performance is insane, though, because he's just sitting there in this park on the swing, and this this look of contentment comes across him, and it's the last moments of his life. Devastating. Just uh, devastating. Um, another one of the saddest movies or saddest deaths I've ever seen in a film. Talk about it all the time. Roberto Benigni's Life is Beautiful. Holy crap. Um, oh, I don't want to go into it too much because I'm afraid of spoiling it. But, you know, when Roberto Benigni's character dies in the film, it's the way he dies at still trying to carry on the charade for his son, even though he knows he is about to die. He puts on this happy, brave face as if he's playing a game and he knows he's being marched off by this German soldier to be shot and executed. But still, as long as his son can see him, he's like, hi, look, we're playing this game. And then it goes around the corner and then you just hear the gunshot. That uh, devastated me. Um, Satine, uh, Nicole Kidman in Moulin Rouge. I love Moulin Rouge. It's it's one of my all-time favorite films. Um, but the, the, the relationship between... Uh, uh, Ewan McGregor's character and and Satine was so passionate and so powerful that when she dies at the end, it's like, <gasps> it, like I found it really, really thing. Um, uh, American History X, that's a big one. When Edward Norton comes in and is Edward Furlong, you know the scene I'm talking about. I mean, that's that's brutal. Um, but I one. <laughs> Maybe none, none of these are in order, by the way, but if I was going to put them more in order, a good argument could be made that the number one has to be Ellie from Up. Um, if you're not crying, me and John Schnepper talking about Up, it's like if you're not crying in the first five minutes or ten minutes of Up, there is seriously something emotionally wrong with you. Um, when Ellie dies, it's just... Just devastating. Just so devastating. I'm sure there are many, many, many more. But um, these are the ones that really stick out to me as the saddest movie deaths for me. All right. How many more do we got here? We got two questions left. So we will move on and we will get to the next question. And this question comes to us from Jordan Allen, who writes... On Sunday's mailbag, uh, I guess you mean last Sunday, John stated that if Indiana Jones is rebooted, he would like to see them go for a solid B list, uh, B class actor. B by the way, Jordan, I did not say B class actor. I said B list actor, and we'll get into the difference in a second. Uh, he would like to see them go for a solid B class actor, but also named Jake Gyllenhaal. I think he's an amazing actor. I have recently watched Prisoners, End of Watch, and Source Code, and they were all great movies, and to me showed that Jake is a very solid actor that can bring a lot of depth with, when he's on screen. So, my question is, uh, my question, is he considered a B-class actor? Should he still be considered a B-class actor? What determines being a certain class of actor? Well, you're not only... Prisoners, End of Watch, Source Code. But he's also got this new movie coming out that's got a lot of buzz behind it called Nightcrawler. And no, it has nothing to do with the blue X-Man character. Um, it's getting a lot of buzz uh, for Jake Gyllenhaal's performance and the movie as a whole is supposed to be really good. But I do want to go back to what I said earlier when I was reading your question. I never said that Jake Gyllenhaal was a B-class actor. I never said that Indiana Jones should go for a B-class actor to play the role. Nor was I suggesting that Jake Gyllenhaal is a B-class actor. I said... I wouldn't want to go to see them go for a big major A list name. I would rather them see see them go for a really talented B list name. And I think when we're talking A list and B list, we're not necessarily talking about talent, although talent plays into it a bit. It's really about who are your major megastars. George Clooney is A list. Brad Pitt is A list. Matt Damon is A list. Um, so. Uh, Daniel Day-Lewis is A-list. Tom Hanks is A-list. Uh, Denzel Washington is A-list. Um, so you start uh, talking about the big major stars. Talent is a part of it, but you're not necessarily defining it by talent. Now, then you go to B-list stars um, who are big, recognizable, but not necessarily in that, you know, George Clooney level of big Hollywood mega power star, right? Not necessarily on that level. Um, I'd say Chris Pratt right now has saw, so has gone from D-list to B-list really quick. And give him another year or two, he'll be A-list soon. 
But I think Chris Pratt is a solid B-list name. Uh, I think there are a, a lot of great actors out there who are solid B-list names. And some of them are some of the best talents in the world. Chiwetel Ejiofor should have just won, if it was up to me, would have won an Academy Award for Best Actor this year. I think he's one of the most brilliantly gifted actors we've seen this generation. But he's not A-list. He's B-list. Even though his talent is A-class, he is a B-list actor in Hollywood right now. And I believe he should be A-list. I should believe he get up there. So, yeah, please, Jordan, don't confuse me calling is, or, or you know breaking down an A-list actor with a B-list actor. And it's totally debatable about who you'd put in which list. It's all subjective and debatable. Just because I say somebody is A-list or just because I say somebody's B-list, that doesn't make them A-list or B-list. That's just my perception of it. Um, but I was not talking about class of actor as if I was evaluating the by talent. I wasn't suggesting that Jake Gyllenhaal was a, a, a um, you know, an underling when it comes to acting talent. No, Jake Gyllenhaal is awesome. He's really great. Um, but is he an A-lister? I'm going to say probably not. Um, so please don't confuse the two because I completely agree with you. He's a phenomenal talent. All right, let's move on to the final question today. And the last question today comes to us. From Dion Lee, who writes, Hey guys, love the show. Well, thanks so much, Dion. With the remake of The Equalizer coming out, do you think if it does well, we will see more 80s crime shows becoming movies? If so, what's on your wish list? I'm hoping for Spencer for Hire. <laughs> Bring on the filthy. Uh, thanks a lot for the question, Dion. Um, 80s shows that I think... Now, remember, there are a lot of great 80s shows that I love, but that I don't necessarily think would make decent movies. So, you know, I love The Cosby Show, but I don't think The Cosby Show would make a good movie. I love Family Ties. That doesn't mean I think The Family Ties would make a good movie. So um, I, I jotted down a list of um, some 80s films that I really did enjoy, some 80s TV shows, I mean, that I really did enjoy that I think would transition well to the big screen as a movie. Uh, and one of them, which has been talked about actually for a long time, but it's never come to fruition, is Magnum P.I., I think Magnum P.I., private detective, living in Hawaii um, with a, a rich benefactor that he solves. I mean, I think there are movies. I think there's a franchise of movies that can be made there. I think, I think that is uh, one they can really look at. Another one that I think would make a great franchise of movies is Simon and Simon. Now, Simon and Simon kind of got overlooked a lot because I believe it, it might have been on the same network as A-Team. And A-Team and, and Knight Rider were kind of overshadowing it. But Simon and Simon is about these these two completely opposite odd couple brothers who create a detective agency. And so you have multiple levels of interesting dynamics. They're brothers, they're completely, one's kind of a cowboy, whatever, the other's a city slicking, you know, uh, a preppy guy. Um, but it was a really great show. And I think that type of dynamic could play well into a movie. Another one, I know some people are going to laugh at me for this, but I would love to see a series of movies of based on Murder, She Wrote. I think one of the big things we're missing genre-wise in movies today is great murder mysteries. Mysteries. Where the audience figures it out along the way too. I think really good, true, solid, pure blood mystery films. Uh, I think would be all, And I think a murder she wrote would be awesome. Uh, yeah, I don't think you can get Angela Lansbury to play it anymore, but I think there are a lot of solid, great actresses that could play, a, play that character. And you could build a franchise around it. I, I really think you can. And speaking of which, I would also do Matlock. Everybody's talking about doing a Perry Mason film, which apparently is in development. I want a Matlock movie. And once again, Andrew Griffin, probably too old now to play the role. But there are other guys you could get to play Matlock. I loved Matlock, actually. When I was a teenager, I would watch Matlock as a teenager. I thought they were really fun. And I thought it was a great show. All right, folks. Well, that'll do it for me for today on this edition, the Sunday edition of AMC Mailbag. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, guys, listen, don't forget, once again, if you want to get your question, you can email us anytime. Send us your thoughts or whatever or your questions for the show. Email us at amcmovietalk at gmail.com 24-7. Maybe you'll see your question on the show. Also, don't forget, lots of great films playing in AMC Theaters right now. Head over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, showtime, and, of course, your movie ticket information. And don't forget... You can follow me on uh, all the on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram, on all the various social media channels, just at John Campia. So that will do it for me for today. Thanks so much, guys, for spending some time with me on the weekend. Um, I cannot wait for AMC Movie Talk to start up again tomorrow. Uh, so make sure you come in and join us for that. So until then, 
My name is John Campia for AMC Movie News, and until such a time, bye-bye.